So as you recall from the last lecture, we talked about the sliding filament theory. And so now we're going to talk a little bit about what happens upstream. We call this excitation contraction coupling. This is, um, the excitation is the idea of the depolarization that occurs in cell membranes or action potentials. Um, <clears throat> the brain or the spinal cord sends information as an action potential, that's via depolarization, we'll talk about that in later lectures. The action potential travels down the axon to the axon terminals. What you see in this picture is an axon terminal coming down a motor neuron, and the yellow spark represents the action potential. And so when the action potential travels down the axon and reaches um, the axon terminal, the spark triggers actually calcium to come in and cause the release of acetylcholine from <clears throat> vesicles through exocytosis. If you familiar, should be familiar with this from some cell biology class. And so the neural transmitters will actually pass through this little area here at the bottom of the neuron, a little space that can't be seen in this picture called the synapse or synaptic cleft, the space. And that is, um, hooking up what, what you call the motor end plate that is found on the cell membrane of skeletal muscle. So this is skeletal muscle um, cell membrane called sacrolemma, where the nerve hooks up is the motor end plate and the space between the axon terminal, looks like a black line here, but it's a little space, is we call the synaptic cleft. And again, neural transmitter is going to be leaving the end of the nerve and travel over and attach to receptors on the skeletal muscle. And then that actually will trigger an action potential in the cell membrane of the muscle, the sacrolemma. And that's what the little spark is here, represented by the little sun-like uh, picture on this cell membrane. And then that um, ex that excitation, that, that action potential will travel down the transverse tubules or the T-tubules. And in close association with the sacroplasmic reticulum, it will cause it to release calcium. And so there's a little protein junctions and attachments between the sacroplasmic reticulum and the transfer tubules that opens up channels that you'll see in animations and a little bit later that causes the calcium to be released and then can travel to the troponin and then move the tropomyosin out of the way and then allow the myosin to grab onto the actin, as you might recall from the previous lecture. If that's confusing, it might be a good time to review that lecture again or watch another YouTube video from other people. And so over here, we see a cross section of a muscle fiber. And you can, as you might recall, the red is the myosin and the blue is the actin. And the sarcomere is contractile unit from Z line to Z line. We also have mitochondria, which makes the ATP that you are, should be familiar with. Okay, so what we're seeing here is the beginning of what's about to happen which is a muscle contraction. First, the nerve impulse comes down. The cell membrane of the muscle becomes excited. And then the release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And then we have the tropomyosin moving out of the way so that the myosin can grab on and shorten the sarcomeres. So this is the before picture, and then here's the after picture. Well, here's a diagram to help explain that. So this is a picture, and then here's a diagram to help explain this. This is, again, the before picture, and then you'll see a diagram over here, which is the after picture. So let's look at the before picture. Here we see just basically the same kind of picture. This diagram kind of shows what was seen in the previous picture. Here we have the axon terminal 
and the little red squares represent the acetylcholine or the neurotransmitter that is released after the action potential travels down the neuron. And so the acetylcholine leaves the axon terminal in the synapse as little squares, and then they can attach to receptors that allow sodium to enter into the cell. That causes depolarization in the cell. We call that an action potential. And again, at the end of the muscle membrane, we call that a motor endpoint. So the action potentials will actually travel down the transfer tubule until it reaches what we call a DHP receptor, which is a protein and receptor that allows to open up a channel on the sarcoplasmic reticulum and allow calcium to flow in to this area down here where you're seeing the cursor, the calcium will flow in attach to the troponin, move the tropomyosin out of the way, and allow the myosin heads to grab onto the actin, and ultimately begin to start the contraction process that you've seen in that comic strip piece, where you go from a relaxed state um, to the rigor state, and then ultimately a power stroke, and so forth. The red in this picture is representing, just to kind of hit this again, the neurotransmitters are going across, causes sodium to enter, and when the sodium comes into the cell, we call that depolarization. What that means is that the inside of the cell becomes more positively charged, thanks to positive ions known as cations that come from sodium. Hopefully you remember a little bit of this from chemistry. So the positive action potential travels down moves the channel out of the way, opens up this door, and which is a channel, a protein channel, allows calcium to flow in and allows for the muscle contraction to occur. This is essentially the excitation part, because remember it's the excitation and contraction coupling. So then the calcium is released, attaches onto the troponin, moves the tropomyosin out of the way, and then that allows for the myosin heads or the globular heads to attach to the active sites of the actin. And then of course ATP is broken down by ATPase into ADP and a free phosphate, and then the phosphate is released, and then we have the power stroke. If that sounds a little bit confusing to you, make sure you go review the comic strip of the six photos again. So that in a nutshell is the excitation contraction coupling. And so when you, these are important slides to learn and will be part of your summary for this particular presentation. Now this picture here is depicting how the excitation and contraction coupling go hand in hand. In this particular picture, we see again our muscle fiber with styrations, those are the red and dark and light areas, so we call styrations. You can see the motor end plate that's found on the muscle cell membrane. And then we have the action potential that travels down the central nervous system to the axon terminal. And then that little space is where the neurotransmitters are released. So the inside becomes more positive because of the action potential. And how do we know that? Well, we have a electrode, electrode that's been pushed in as a needle into the axon terminal that can read the voltages. And we find that the voltages increase. We go from a negative 70 millivolts up to a positive 30 millivolts as the action potential travels down. The neurotransmitters are released, in this case, most likely acetylcholine. And then the muscle membrane becomes more positive through depolarization. And that's what's shown in this picture here. We see the muscle membrane goes from a negative 90 millivolts to a positive 30 millivolts. Again, all of this is taking place within milliseconds. And from there, the muscle begins to contract and then relax. How does it relax? Oh, the calcium is pumped back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. 
So remember, if you go back to the previous slide, this is what triggered the calcium to be released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum attached to the troponin, and then the myosin can do its contraction. So all of this we're talking about takes place within 100 milliseconds or so, or a little bit more than that. We've got a couple of milliseconds for the nerve impulse to come down, for the muscle membrane to change its charge, and then for the calcium to be released and for the myosin to do its thing, pulling the sarcomeres closer together. That all happens within 100 and something milliseconds, which is just, if you think about it, unbelievably fast. Now, before we move into smooth muscle, I would like to show you um, an animation of how this all takes place. Okay, so now we're gonna continue with excitation contraction coupling. This is an animation to help you to visualize what is going on. This is the motor end plate of a muscle membrane down here. This is the nerve. So here we have the axon terminal. You can see there's mitochondria. This is mitochondria, that's mitochondria. Down here at the bottom, you're seeing the um, myofibrils and you got the actin and you got your myosin and your titan. From, and this is stuff that you should be familiar with from last lecture, as long as your sac zeolines representing your sarcomere contractile unit of muscles. And then here you can see receptors that are associated with the muscle membrane that's gonna allow depolarization to occur in the muscle membrane. These green um, or vesicles represent the, the holdings of the neurotransmitters that'll be released after the action potential travels down the brain. So you're thinking about moving and you move or you don't, it comes from the spinal cord. The information travels down the motor neuron, which is the type of neuron that's involved in movement. And, and then of course, we have the actions of the muscles. Again, we call that excitation contraction coupling. We know that excitation is how the nervous system stimulates an action potential. So this is representing the action potential traveling down. We also call this depolarization, and so sodium is entering into the neuron to allow this to happen. Potential in the muscle fiber sarcolemma. In order for a skeletal muscle to function, it must contract, which means it gets shorter. And when a muscle gets shorter, the skeleton moves at the joint it crosses. The series of events that links these two phases together is called excitation contraction coupling. First, a wave of action potential spreads from the motor end plate in all directions. This is similar to the ripples formed on a pond when a stone is thrown. When this wave of excitation reaches the transverse tubules, which are commonly known as T-tubules, it continues down them into the sarcoplasm of the muscle fiber. As you gotta remember, the transverse tubules is just basically the cell membrane coming internally inside the cell fiber, muscle fiber, muscle cell. And again, sodium's coming in when we talk about action potential. So sodium's coming into the cell. Where was the sodium to begin with? It was outside here. Your cells basically kind of live in a saline-like solution. And we think that this basic phenomenon actually evolved from animals that lived in the ocean and you had to deal with salt. And then that was that ability to deal with salt as a simple animal evolved into this complexity where it's now used in regards to action potentials and so forth. Next, the action potential stimulates the opening of voltage-gated ion channels in the T-tubules. These channels are physically linked to calcium channels in the terminal cisterny of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. These calcium channels open as well. And since calcium ions are higher in concentration in the sarcoplasmic reticulum than they are in the sarcoplasm, they diffuse out and into the cytosol. The calcium ions will now bind to the troponin of the sarcomere's thin filaments. The main protein of the thin filament is called actin. This binding causes the troponin tropomyosin complex to change shape and move into a groove on the actin. This exposes active sites on the actin filament. The active sites are now available for binding to myosin heads, which are the main protein of the thick filament. 
Okay. So let me see if I can find another one for you. Okay, let's look at, at excitation contraction coupling from another animation point of view. I, um, I think this will help you to visualize it. Uh, remember that um, a neuron, this is what's shown in this picture here, is um, not all of it's shown here, but we've got the axon coming down with axon terminal. So it could actually be innervating multiple um, skeletal muscle fibers, not just one. And each muscle fiber is a muscle cell. So your muscles are, can eat, are always kind of in a, a mixture of relaxed and um, there's some tone. So some are being fired on, being activated, some aren't. So there's a mixture. And when you lift something heavy, well, more motor neurons are releasing and, or, and innervating and turning on um, more muscle fiber. So the, so the frequency of action potentials are traveling down from your brain or your spinal cord. And that frequency actually activates more muscle fibers when you try to lift something heavy. So let's look at excitation contraction coupling. Typically, a single motor neuron arising in the brain or spinal cord conducts action potentials that travel to hundreds of skeletal muscle fibers within a muscle. The sequence of events that converts action potentials in a muscle fiber. So the action potential, as you can see, is the spark coming down and being spread across. ...to a contraction is known as excitation-contraction coupling. If we look at a single muscle fiber, we see that an action potential travels across the entire sarcolemma and is rapidly conducted into the interior of the muscle fiber by structures called transverse tubules. Transverse, or T-tubules, are regularly spaced in foldings of the sarcolemma that branch extensively throughout the muscle fiber. At numerous junctions, the T-tubules make contact with a calcium-storing membranous network known as a sarcoplasmic reticulum, or SR. Where it abuts the T-tubule, the SR forms sac-like bulges called terminal cisterni. So here's your transverse tubule here, and then here's your sarcoplasmic reticulum. And again, the terminal cisterna is the bulges that are found on the SR or the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And you'll see this closely associated with the transverse tubules. So when the depolarization travels down the sacralima down the transfer tubules, it's going to activate the release of calcium. One portion of a T-tubule plus two adjacent terminal cisterni is known as a triad. The membranes of... So you can see how the triad, one, two, three. And then here's the channel. We, we called it a DHP receptor channel kind of thing. There's a long name for it that I can't quite recall. The T-tubule and terminal cisterni are linked by a series of proteins that control calcium release. As an action potential travels down the T-tubule, it causes a voltage-sensitive protein to change shape. This shape change opens a calcium release channel in the SR, allowing calcium ions to flood the sarcoplasm. This rapid influx of calcium triggers a contraction of the skeletal muscle fiber. Thus, calcium ions are responsible for the coupling of excitation to the contraction of skeletal muscle fibers. All right, so I think you got at least the gist of it. It's just connected to one another. So now let's get an introduction to how smooth muscles work and then we'll go over the lecture material for that. I won't get too far in this next section, but the next section we're gonna talk about smooth muscle contraction. Remember that in skeletal muscle, we had potentially hundreds of nuclei. In smooth muscles, we have a, usually a single nucleus. It's elliptical, and we don't see the striations. 
In fact, the sarcomeres are, are really sarcomeres in the sense of what we see in skeletal muscles. What we see in skeletal muscles, or excuse me, what we see in smooth muscles. So skeletal muscles have sarcomeres and obvious gyrations. Smooth muscles, we don't see the gyrations, and the myosin and the actin are going in different directions. And so here you can see myosin and actin, and it's the dense bodies that the actin are joined to. And then you have some intermediate scaffolding or folding. This is again all different types of proteins. And so literally the filaments will pass each other, but instead of just being a clean movement like you see in the sarcomeres, the muscle membrane itself is all kind of shrinking down in different directions. And this helps in the churning of the smooth muscles in the intestines and so forth. Let me show you a picture of that here. Here you can see in the elliptical shape of a smooth muscle. You can see here the nucleus and nucleolus, and then you got the dense bodies here that the actin are joined to, and then the myosin is contracting and pulling the dense bodies closer to each other. And then we get this bundled or globular shape when the smooth muscle contracts. So it's really ratcheting across the entire smooth muscle. So here's another picture of smooth muscle. It's elliptical in shape. It's uh, got dense bodies, it has thick myosin, and then it'll go in different directions and help shrink up the smooth muscle. So here's another picture of it. So you can see it's not this, this sarcomere. It's actually coming from this direction and this direction, pulling the dense bodies to, in different directions and really ratcheting it down tight. There's uh, quite a bit of differences in how smooth muscles work versus um, skeletal muscles in regards to contraction. We're gonna get into more about how smooth muscles contract in our next lecture. For this lecture, I want you to write a half page summary of what you learned, which is excitation, contraction, coupling is the focus. And I want you to draw um, this slide and this slide and explain what's going on. Take a picture of it and upload it onto Western Online. So again, this will be lecture number three. I want you to draw excitation, contraction, coupling, provide the diagram and the details that you see in this picture and this picture, the before and after, and explain what you've learned in a paragraph and then upload that onto Western Online. Anyway, I hope that this lecture helps to better cement in what is happening with excitation, contraction, coupling, and a sliding filament theory in regards to how skeletal muscle works. I encourage you to watch a few more YouTube videos if that helps you to understand the topics. Read your textbook is another great way to really learn this material. And of course, uh, practice with the, with the descriptions and drawings. If you find yourself really falling behind, make sure that you put in the extra effort. You know, you should spend an hour or two working on learning this material for each lecture. So with that, I will see you in lecture number four. Take care.